Welcome back to the PFC podcast. The views and opinions you are about to hear are the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of anyone else. Now on to the podcast. Welcome back to the PFC podcast. This is Dennis and today I am with Alex. How are you doing today? Mm, so great. Thanks. Thanks for having me back. It's good to see you again, my friend. Very good to see you. And the um, reason why I got you on is one, you do the JSON podcast where you do a lot of uh, looking over research and uh, kind of critiquing and talking about it. Um, and fairly recently, pelvic binders have uh, come into question and is this relevant or not? So um, I thought you'd be the perfect guy to come uh, and talk about the truth of the matter. Uh, well, as I found out in my marriage, truth is a squishy subject. So, uh, you know, I think we'll have a nice conversation today. Um, but I, as we were just talking about before we started recording, I think it'll be pretty fun to hopefully get somebody super angry at my opinions and have them come and give a counter opinion. So the, the truth is subjective and, uh, you know, your uh, perception is your reality. So people will have to figure out kind of what they want to believe in the end. But, um, yeah, super excited. This was really fun to have a pretty vociferous debate on social media about this, and, and I appreciate the opportunity. Um, so for those uh, folks out there that I haven't had the chance to work for and work with, uh, I'm Alex Markle, a trauma surgery PA, and um, this is a really fantastic topic because uh, my career spectrum has spanned pre-hospital care, where I was just a dumb EMT paramedic, did a bunch of ski patrol, worked for the Forest Service, fighting fires, eventually came and did PA school um, and was initially working in the ER for a number of years, did orthopedic trauma for a while, and then ended up finding out um, that really the fun stuff is doing trauma surgery. So I've been doing that for, gosh, about 15 years or so, uh, working in the ICU, seeing patients in the recess bay, going to the OR. Um, and I'm going to put a plug out there as well because uh, I am part of a small number of Army PAs uh, who have gone to the ELFET, the Long-Term Health Education Training, hosted at Brook Army Medical Center. So it's an 18-month program hosted by the Army, but it's actually available for tri-service PAs. Um, and you learn how to manage a patient in the recess bay, um, how to take them directly to the operating room for damage control surgery, manage them in the ICU, and really do that totality of trauma care that none of the rest of our, our colleagues short of the trauma surgeons tend, tend to get. So I like to call us the um, precious 72 experts because we encompass all the precious metals. So uh, we're, we're pretty good at the platinum 10. Um, we're really good at the golden hour. And also we are the ones who are going to do the damage control surgery after an hour and manage that patient for 72 hours during their critical resuscitation and take them back to the OR. Um, so there's a few of my counterparts out there on the ARSTs. Um, if you guys are familiar with them, they're fantastic. And there are opportunities to go to our fellowship. Uh, every year, we've got a number of slots that go unfilled, and that's not due to our selection process. Um, that's because there are no applicants. So if you're a PA across the tri-service and want more info, feel free to hit me up. I'm on the faculty. Um, and it's a humbling experience to manage critically ill patients in their time of need. Um, and it doesn't always go well, as Dave Harden put out on, on your podcast a couple of weeks ago. Um, we're going to talk about how to optimize care for the trauma patient in PFC. Perfect. Perfect. So um, you wouldn't mind just kicking off. Like if somebody has a pelvic injury, kind of what happens? So I know you had a little PowerPoint, so you wouldn't mind kicking that off? Uh, I like that you say little. I, I went full, um, full academic on this. Yeah, I think that might be the case. Uh, so again, you can see up there, my civilian practice is up here in Montana. And if anybody listening wants to come do some MPT with me, hit me up. We have great trauma patients and a great place. Uh, this is me a few years ago, managing a critically ill uh, special operations member, uh, in a far forward environment with a, a host of amazing counterparts. Um, and this is near and dear, right? So this is stuff that we see every day and it's, it's really important that we get this right. Um, and again, uh, listening to your previous podcast, I was just listening to Mark Shapiro's on extremity trauma um, and, and Dave Harden, just a phenomenal pod podcast. Uh, 
We don't always do that. But uh, here's my disclaimer, right? So I'm not a, an actual physician, just a PA. There, there are smarter people out there than I. Um, and that is, in the Army anyway, going to be your Mike for trauma critical care surgeons. They are phenomenal. I'm also not a medic. Um, you guys out there are much better than I am at doing dirt medicine. Um, and I haven't been to any cool guy schools. I'm just a conventional schlub. Occasionally, I get on a surgical team and I support you guys, but just a conventional schmuck. Um, and we are definitely going to stir up some debate here. People are going to strongly disagree with me, and that's okay. Um, I heard a, a great quote years ago that the opposite of love isn't hate, it's apathy. So if you absolutely hate my opinions here, that's awesome because that means you care about taking great care of your patients, and, and I'm very okay with that. And I look forward to getting some diatribes because that's just going to encourage all of us to do a better job. Um, and there, there was actually a great... Um, letter to the editor years and years ago when I first started PA school and and they said what do you do when you as the PA disagree with your physician um, and it was kind of it was one of those Ooh, that's a good question and somebody wrote this great answer that said well we have this really phenomenal debate because both of us care about doing the best thing for our patients um, and so disagreements okay uh, we just need to care about doing a great job of taking care of great patients so Here's what I'd like to cover today is, um, what is research? Which is a, a big question. Uh, and then we should always, of course, review some anatomy and injury. And then we can go through kind of the, some of the, I'm going to say research in air quotes that was thrown out in some social media about the benefits of pelvic binders and POI and golden hour care. Um, and then I think you and I are going to have a chat about how that applies to PFC because uh, I'm still not sure. So um, most of you are probably too old to remember Carl Sagan, phenomenal uh, astrophysicist. And, and I love this quote from him because he would go into some astrophysics thing, but say that, you know, if you want to make an apple pie from scratch, first you have to invent the universe. And that really applies to, I think, all of these topics, which is before you start citing research, you probably need to understand research. And so there are a lot of different ways that we can go over the levels of research or the quality. Uh, this is one of the original ones from the Journal of Chest in 1989. Um, and by and large, we're trying to do a better job of using this in our JSON podcast to give guys a better idea of what quality level these research articles are. Um, this is a much bigger one that came out in 2009 in the Journal of Trauma. You don't need to read through it. Just kind of, again, big picture, understand that levels of research start at level one. That's the really great research. We want to change our practice based on that. And then it kind of gets worse and worse all the way down to level five. And, and you can see on this chart, level five is expert opinion without explicit critical appraisal. That's another code for garbage. Um, and, and fun story, actually, if you've ever taken the ATLS course and they have those um, classifications of shock that I'm guessing you guys teach that at the JSOM TC, probably. Yeah, yeah so um, fun trivia. Do you actually know where those classifications were created? Do not. It was two orthopedic surgeons, which sounds like the beginning of a joke, um, at a bar writing it on the back of a bar napkin. I kid you not, there is no research based on the levels of, of hemorrhage, which is fascinating. Um, and yet that's doctrine for us. So I put this out in the, the JSOM a few years ago. This is kind of my take on the levels of research and where they are. Um, and anecdote is not research. So um, when somebody says one time this thing happened once to them, that, in my humble opinion, should not be considered practice-changing evidence because um, that's not even a case report or a case series. But unfortunately, in some of our operational environments, that's really all we have. Uh, and I will credit Mike Remley with really helping me pull my head out of my um, posterior orifice uh, a number of years ago because I was, I was having a tirade with him about why we're not using high quality evidence in the operational environment. And he looked at me and said, Alex, we don't have the data. We don't have the research. And so, you know, this is where I kind of came up with this idea that 
in the hospital, we can do everything, I'm going to say, quote unquote, right. We can use that level 1A evidence and do things perfectly. In the operational environment, we don't always have, we rarely, if ever, have access to all the right tools. And so there's more risk in the operational environment and less benefit. And that is at our heart what we are beholden, in my opinion, to communicate to our operational commanders is they're the ones who are ultimately assuming the risk for care capabilities that are degraded beyond the hospital. And that's okay because we're not here to provide care. We're here to support operations. Um, and a lot of my physician colleagues tend to forget that. You know, and then I'll, I'll even throw out there that, um, you know, right now I'm working at a non-academic trauma center in the middle of nowhere. And so we actually don't even have that capability that is taught in a lot of journal articles. Um, for example, with pelvic uh, fractures, the, the research is going to tell us that we want to take those patients to interventional radiology and embolize them. That's what we're going to talk about in a few minutes. My hospital, we don't always have access to that. So, you know, big picture, again, I think we need to understand the, the research and how that um, denotes benefits and risk in your operational environment. And, and we don't have to say yes or no to anything, but we just have to be experts at communicating what risk those operational commanders are assuming. And then, bloody stuff. This is my favorite. So anatomy and physiology. Um, I was going to you know, start at the 60,000 foot view. So we all know those two big pipes there, the red ones and the blue ones have lots of life-saving fluid in there. Um, and you can see as they go down to the L5S1, um, they actually it's at L4 is where they bifurcate from the aorta to the common iliac and then they bifurcate again to the internal and external iliac um, and then as we know once it passes under the uh, inguinal ligament then it becomes the femoral artery all that is to say there's a lot of blood flow down there and if we drill in this is an even better uh, view you don't need to know all of these named arteries I usually have to review the, the textbook but there's a lot of blood flow in there. Um, and when you look at the textbook, it's not actually the arteries that carry most of the blood flow. The, the arteries only carry about a third of your vasculature. About two thirds is in the, the venous flow. Um, a surprising amount is in the, uh, the splanchnic vasculature. Um, and when we look at these pelvic fractures, somewhere around two thirds to 80% of these bleeds in the pelvis are actually venous, not arterial. Um, are you guys teaching numbers in the, the JSON TC? How do you guys break this down? I guess, what do you mean? <laughs> do we teach numbers? Oh yeah. In terms of if somebody has got a, a pelvic bleed, uh, how often should you be worried about arterial versus venous bleeding? Uh, no, we don't get into that specifics. Yeah. So we'll, We'll show why that matters here in a few minutes, but um, as we all know, of course, the difference is venous bleeding is high volume, low pressure, and arterial is high pressure, lower volume, because those are much smaller pipes. Um, so again, just kind of understanding the anatomy. And then the injury patterns. So this is the Jones, whatever, classification that was, again, cited in social media as being super important. And when you have a pelvic fracture, you really only have three different injury patterns. And again, some orthopedic surgeon is going to tear me apart for saying it's more nuanced than that. And that's true. There is a lot more detail to it. But talking 60,000 foot view, this was actually the chart that they shared with us. And so you can see the row in the middle is the lateral compression. And so that's when you get hit from the side and it actually squeezes everything in. Um, in the civilian environment, this is incredibly commonly seen as we can see with, is that Ralph Wiggum, I think? I love Ralph. Um, when, he, <laughs> when he gets hit crossing the street um, and that's actually the most common injury pattern that I see in my civilian hospital is somebody getting hit um, as a pedestrian on the side. The other place that you will very commonly see this in the civilian environment is a T-bone injury for a either passenger or driver when there's intrusion into the, the passenger compartment. You can get that pushing in. Um, the other really interesting uh, 
fracture pattern is that vertical shear. And that's most often seen from a jump from height when one foot hits something like a stair before the other, and it actually pushes up the femur through the acetabulum and shears off that entire pelvic wing, as we can see there. Um, that, that's a, a unicorn injury. You very, very rarely are going to see that uh, in your practice. I've seen it once, and it was a missed injury. The dude very nearly died from retroperitoneal hemorrhage that was um, not identified. And then the money injury is the APC, so that anterior-posterior compression when you're squished front to back. Um, that's the one where, as you can see, going from left to right, the uh, pubis symphysis just opens up bigger and bigger, and that causes um, what looks like opening a book in the back. So that's our open book pelvic fracture. Um, and in the civilian environment, this is most commonly seen from somebody getting hit by a car while they're facing the car or even getting squished against a wall. Um, what's your guys' kind of textbook definition of when to be worried about an open book fracture over at the schoolhouse, Dennis? I mean, essentially we're talking about like landmines, um, mm -hmm. different blasts, falls. Um, that's generally the, the situations that we're coming in. So mm. um, also, you know, uh, GSWs, shrapnel injuries, uh, it's not necessarily, you know, impact. It's, you know, a bullet or something coming through and just shattering. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, and, and I'm so glad you brought that up because it's incredibly important um, because this is yet again one of the big differences between civilian medicine and operational combat medicine. So um, to your point, with dismounted IED blasts, uh, this is a phenomenal study that was done actually in mice, but what they showed is that from the secondary blast wave, um, you tended to get the leg that would just kind of rip itself out of the pelvis, and that would cause that same open book pelvic fracture, ripping the pubis symphysis and causing a widening of the sacroiliac joint posteriorly, which causes that vascular injury. Um, so this is incredibly important to understand and appreciate, and it is a significant difference between civilian practice where most of us get most of our exposure. And then there's this other weird um, injury pattern from mounted IED blasts, as you can see, where just the, the sacrum essentially gets a significant amount of, of pressure on there, but we don't really expect that's going to cause a significant amount of bleeding. So... You know, in reviewing kind of the trauma surgery um, flow of patient care, we need to remember that there are four phases of damage control surgery because this really applies to the flow of patients regardless of where they are. So we always start with pre-hospital damage control and then hemodynamic support. So that damage control resuscitation is those hemostatic adjuncts that you were talking about earlier. Um, so the, the TXA may be calcium. If you're a believer in calcium, I am. There, there is debate about that. And then obviously, big volume resuscitation. And, and we actually consider this phase zero of damage control surgery because uh, many of us have rushed a patient to the OR, intubated them while they're hypovolemic. Um, and as soon as you put that paralytic in and their vascular tone goes away, they die on you. And that's, um, that is not what we're there for. So, <laughs> so important to take a knee for a second and do that DCR for you. And then we do surgical temporization, which for us in surgery really just means two things with a, a deranged patient, which is you go in, you stop any bleeding by whatever means are possible, and you stop um, contamination. So for us, um, if there's poo spilling into the abdomen, you kind of staple that off, whip stitch it, whatever you need to do. And then this patient is deranged, right? They have some significant uh, problems with coagulopathy, probably hypothermia, all of those lethal diamonds. And so we get them out of the OR as soon as possible and get them to the post-op ICU to normalize their physiology. And then at some point, once their physiology is normalized, and we've got the time and white space. We'll take them in for definitive surgery, whatever that may be. Um, is this how you guys are teaching your, your PFC surgical modules? 
um, a version of that. Like we can't okay. go in and uh, like surgically temporize anything. Really, like we mm. can't go in the abdomen. You can't really go into the chest. Um, so hemorrhage control, uh, largely with tourniquets or pressure dressings or something like that. Um, we definitely are very quick when it comes to getting access of some kind and crushing in blood. Um, with the attempt of normalizing their physiology and getting a stable a patient as possible for evacuation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, you touch on just the the profound difference in the in UW environment that your medics practice in compared to what tools I have available at a civilian trauma center with all the resources, bright lights, cold steel, and all the personnel that we need. Um, you guys have a much, much harder job than we do with much more limited resources and often more severely injured patients. And um, that's never a fun place to be. Uh, right? And so, yeah. I I don't envy you. You guys are, I think, a lot better at this than, than we are. Um, and so when you apply kind of that same mindset of damage control surgery to the roles of care in the military, uh, of course, at POI, we're going to do that great TC3 that you guys are experts in. Um, and then we're immediately moving into DCR here. And um, the soft world, I think, has done obviously a much better job than conventional in pushing DCR farther forward. Um, when I was working at Brook Army Medical Center, we were able to take care of some severely injured rangers who probably in previous um, conflicts would not have survived, and that was due wholly to the phenomenal work that medics were doing on POI, and uh, it was really great to see. And then, you know, for us in the standard roles of care, we're doing that DCR, that surgical temporization at our forward surgical teams, usually split teams, uh, which is, again, where most of my operational experience has been. Um, but most of our surgical teams don't have any hold capability. So these, these people are immediately being pushed out to the role three uh, to do some, some post-op normalization of physiology, and then they can get definitive surgery, either at role three or role four. Um, obviously, there are variations to this depending on what surgical asset you're talking about. And then, as you guys know better than I do, depending on your casualty category for host nation folks, they may not even be able to get to our role three or um, may go to host nation earlier than that in their, their role of care. But this is just kind of big picture. Um, and, and I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the amazing things that have been done at POI. So for those who are not familiar, John Hins uh, was a phenomenal motorcycle racing doctor in Ireland. And if you want to see just incredible care uh, that's unclass, because we know that incredible care gets done by your community, but that's, that's all classified. Um, this guy is just, oh, holy smokes. Uh, so he had his own motorcycle. He had the fastest ambulance in the world. I think he could do like 205 miles an hour. Um, you can see him on the far right there with the picture doctor. Uh, that, that particular casualty was a motorcycle that came off the track, as you can see there, uh, hit a woman and her three children. Um, she should have died. She didn't, which was amazing due to his work. Same thing on the left. Uh, so that casualty was actually dead when his team arrived. Um, and he says that his team within 60 seconds can do bilateral chest tubes, uh, pelvic binder, uh, pull fractures out to length, intubate, and I think there's one other. Oh, and of course, vascular resuscitation. All right. So, I mean, you can do amazing things very, very quickly. But that is not the topic of discussion on the PFC podcast. We're not interested in POI care. Um, so I, I do encourage folks to check out some of the great work John Hins did. So, um, oh, speaking of, just out of curiosity, have you followed any of his stuff? Have you seen yes. what he's done? Um, I've seen, <laughs> I've, uh, if you go into YouTube, like the MCRIT stuff, um, uh, he's got a, he's got a couple of talks. Um, I forget the name of the conference, but they're, they're really good. They're about, uh, the racetrack, the medicine that they were talking about. Um, mm -hmm. from what I remember, he didn't, he didn't put chest tubes in. They did, were able to do bilateral thoracotomies put the pelvic mm. binder on, intubate, mm. and get access rolling very quick. Um, however, 
I would say he's got a team that was dedicated just to that task. And that was almost SOP coming upon a scene. Um, but he had a really good talk yeah. about impact brain apnea. And uh, mm-hmm. and uh, that was kind of uh, enacting that SOP, essentially. Yeah, I think you're right, actually. Um, yeah, and that's... Gosh, you're right. Was that... I can't remember the name of that conference. We'll have to find that out later on because it was it was phenomenal. Uh, so he actually died doing what he loved uh, on the motorcycle. Um, but getting back to you know the topic at hand, so again from a doctrinal perspective, if you are far forward doing hemodynamic support, your hypovolemic patient is going to do one of three things for you. They're either going to be a responder, meaning their blood pressure is going to go back up to somewhere around normal. Um, they're going to be a transient responder. They're going to go back up life is going to be good, and then they're going to go back down, or they're not going to respond at all. And so that tells you that your patient forces you into action. So if they're a responder, life is good, right? You can move on. Um, They have built that clot. They've stabilized. You can go take care of somebody else who's more critically injured. These These are great patients. We love them. If despite vascular replenishment, your patient's blood pressure remains in the toilet, they have told you that they have to go to the OR um, or perhaps be expectant. And then the really challenging ones are these ones where, yeah, if you got unlimited amounts of blood, maybe you can just keep squeezing blood in while you're taking care of more critically injured patients. Um, Maybe you've got to take them immediately. These are challenging patients from a medical decision-making perspective. They do not fit within many algorithms. Um, And then when you take them to the OR for their temporizing surgery, um, this is not me with my good ideas because I'm not very smart, uh, but I actually went to the orthopedic doctrine, which is OrthoBullets. It's a publicly available website. It doesn't require a login. I highly recommend it. Um, And this is some very up-to-date information from three days ago, four days ago. Holy smokes, that is fast. Look at that. I love it. Uh, So what they're saying that we need to be doing for these pelvic ring fractures is first resuscitate, uh, then put on a uh, pelvic binder, and then X-fix or embolization with um, interventional radiology. Cool. I like it. What does the Joint Trauma Service Clinical Practice Guidelines say about surgical temporization for pelvic fractures? Yes, we should 100% do a pelvic binder at POI in that golden hour. Um, For our austere surgery teams, preperitoneal packing, super easy to do if you get the time and the equipment. Um, I'm actually currently teaching my surgeons here at our civilian hospital how to do it because they don't have the exposure. Um, Or pelvic X-fix. Uh, I probably would not do this in a forward surgical team. I usually deploy uh, in the capability of an orthopedic uh, surgical person on surgical teams, and we do certainly have X fixes. It takes a while. It takes radiography, um, and it's just a difficult thing to do in a limited resource environment. So we have X or we have pelvic binders. I mean, if you really wanted to be full hua, you could consider doing this. Um, it would probably not be my practice recommendation for a medic by themselves alone and afraid. But if you've got yeah. an adult in the room that wants to take the hit uh, later on for M&M, then cool. Um, what do you think? Yeah, I think so. Uh, we had uh, Stacy Shackford and Jen Gurney come and train us how to do uh, packing, abdominal packing. Um, which also keep in mind, we only learned like the first half where you stop the bleeding, right? Mm-hmm. Um, we don't have the resources. We don't have the actual help because you need yeah. you need one, just having done it, um, I would say you need at least two people that actually know what they're doing. Um, you need a resuscitationist, so his job is to just squeeze blood. And you need somebody who knows anesthesia really well. And most of our operational teams do not have just that number of talented people. Um, We have very smart people who could learn, but uh, the odds are probably small. 
Um, and then resource management, just the amount of blood you'll need as soon as you open that up uh, is going to be astonishing because you've just unroofed whatever tamponade you built up until then. Um, I don't think that's really an option unless like you've, this is like a purpose built thing, I think. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, it it harkens to the super important part of surgical decision making that we actually teach our mm-hmm. surgical residents, which is sure you can do something, but where's it going, bro? Um, yeah. And and I think your your point is well taken. If you got like one eighteen delta and you got two units of blood, and you are ninety six hours from surgical care, man why are you bothering? Because you know that's essentially futile care, as heartbreaking as that is to say. Right. Yeah, that's fair. I, I would agree with all that. Um, and then pelvic X fix. Uh, I have actually worked with some 18 deltas to, to practice um, X fix on like fractured tibias and stuff, and, and it is a very easy skill to learn for extremities. Um mm-hmm. Do you want to take a whole kit with you? Probably not. Do you want to put this on in the pelvis? I don't think it's a great idea. How about you? Um, to be honest, I have no experience with uh, putting X fixes like the limbs. I would be okay with. Um, I think the number of times I would have to do it is probably small and maybe not worth the the training and retraining that's required to do it. Um, mm-hmm. But an extremity, if you really screw it up really badly, I can fix all these problems with a tourniquet, right? No matter how bad you mangled it, um, you could fix it, the problem with a tourniquet, um, ligation, etc. The pelvis, I don't have a real good answer for if you really mess it up. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, you're 100% right. So, in the the... PFC environment, as far as temporization, my opinion is we probably have the pelvic binder that you can use, but should you is the question we're trying to answer today. Um, And then at some point, this patient, if they have a vascular injury in their pelvis, needs definitive surgery. Um, What does definitive surgery look like? Well, again, uh, this is not Alex making stuff up. It's what do the orthopedic surgeon community think? Well, depending on the injury pattern, you've got a couple of different outcomes that you're going to as far as definitive surgical care. You can see for all those, if it's a low-grade injury, perhaps non-operative management with protected weight-bearing. Most of them have some component of definitive surgical fixation with either plates or screws, perk pinning, um, or perhaps that giant uh, SI screw that goes through the the posterior. Um, It's really fun to see and terrifying because you have to delicately mix miss a bunch of nerve bundles. Um, Fun story. I saw one that didn't miss the nerve bundle. That was a bummer. Right, so here's where these patients are going. Either non-operative management, uh, open reduction, internal fixation, or percutaneous pinning. And how do you figure out how to do that? Um, It's with imaging. Um, And when we don't have imaging in the PFC environment, which is our whole point, what do we do about that? Well, um, again, this is kind of the overview, how I tend to externalize thinking about the roles of care and and how patients are treated. Um, I hope some folks find it helpful. If you want a copy of it, feel free to let me know. Um, But let's now, now that we know the doctrine, let's talk about the evidence because um, I'm going to be a bit of a jerk and say, that in the discussions we've been having on social media, there have been some folks that have had some magical thinking about this. Um, what's been your your insight on the ongoing discussion about this topic? Um, my insight is I think people are they're too emotional about what sides they're on. Um, I think <laughs> um, I think there's a lot, especially in just in social media in general. It's a lot of I'm right. I'm going to Google mm. all the research that shows I'm right uh, um, mm. without the context of the situation um, being very specific. Uh, so I generally just 
keep out of it and just watch from the sidelines and eat popcorn and think of who I can talk to about uh, where, where's the truth in this. Ooh, that's, boy, you are smart, smart, smart. That's fair. Uh, and so in the, the same talk with uh, John Hins, he actually said almost exactly the same thing, which is, you're going to do something by yourself, alone and afraid, and the next day everybody's going to start Monday morning quarterbacking you. And, and there are four categories of people that you're generally going to see. So the sycophants are the folks who just fawn over you for being amazing no matter what you do. Even if you did it wrong, they're still going to say that you're the world's most amazing fill-in-the-blank. Um, those are people generally to be avoided because they will lull you into a false sense of security and create some hubris. And, and we don't necessarily do the right thing for the patients when we listen to sycophants. The supporters are generally the folks who understand the literature, more importantly, understand where your practice pattern is. And they're the ones who are going to say, yeah, maybe that was or wasn't the right thing to do, but boy, you were in a tough situation having to make hard decisions by yourself in a, in a really challenging environment. And I, I support your decision-making because you were the one there at the time doing that. And, and those are nice folks to have and allies and people that you want to keep in your stable. Um, what John Hinn says is the skeptics are the most important people to keep around you because they're the ones who are going to question what you did. But if you can rationally explain your thought process and they will be won over to your side based on logic and thought. Those are good people to keep around. Um, and and I, I really like that thought process. And then, of course, because John Hins is, uh, was Irish, he says, you will always run into wankers. And wankers <laughs> um, understand the evidence, but they criticize you anyway, or they're just too stupid to understand the evidence. Um, and... I'm going to be a bit of a jerk here, and I'm going to say, uh, we've certainly seen some wankers in this discussion. Uh, but uh, <laughs> moving on, so um, in, in the chat group that we were in, uh, one of our colleagues threw in five papers to your point that they immediately Googled and said that there was a very important reason to use pelvic binders because of these five papers. So you know what I did? I pulled up the papers and I read them all. Um, of the five papers, one was actually a book chapter just about how to apply binders. And as we talked about ahead of time, you know, the knowledge translation window for getting something in a book in medicine is about 17 years. So I ignored that. That was, that was garbage. Um, there was also an article that was a um, CAT scan study of cadavers either with open or closed pelvic fractures and it was showing how much volume was in the pelvis whether it was open or closed and that article actually said that there wasn't that much difference also garbage i i actually don't care about that um but of the three that were left oh, oh man i missed my notes um there were these three articles that were cited uh this one uh, was a single center study had very very low enrollment um and it showed no difference in patients who had a pelvic binder versus those who did not. Not super helpful and doesn't argue for pelvic binders. Um, this one was just a, I'm going to be a jerk, I'm sorry. This is a joke of an article to throw in there. It's uh, from, you can see, La Tunisie Medical. So it's from a single hospital in Tunisia, which does not really apply to our practice pattern. Um, and what they were looking at, as you can see from the title, is missed injuries in pre-hospital trauma patients. And they found a number of missed injuries, in, including in the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. But I don't know that that matters. Because <laughs> they, they didn't actually report on, did the patient need more blood? Did they die? Like, who cares? This is a chart review study. Yeah. Did you... Um, you happen to, to look at this one? Did you notice anything else with it? Um, I didn't, but just from the, the title alone, I was uh, you need you know to what end? Like why why right. does this matter? Yeah, hundred percent. And again, very low quality evidence if you understand what evidence is. And then this was the the fifth 
article that was cited by our colleague. Um, and uh, so you look at the title, right, it's from a big journal, the American Journal of Surgery. You look at the, the title and you think to yourself, this is a pretty good article. This is probably good quality evidence. And so, and our colleague in, in the chat group said that this is definitive evidence that you should use a pelvic binder. Well, uh, I read the article. And it was two groups of patients. It was those um, who did have a pelvic fracture who got our early manual compression um, versus those who did not have early manual compression, basically a pelvic binder. Um, and when they compared those two groups in a retrospective manner, what they found, this is screenshot from the article. Oh, sad panda. There is no difference in people who do have pelvic fractures, whether they did or did not get a pelvic binder. Um, so when our colleagues throw out these Google Journal articles and say that we should be using pelvic binders in TC3, uh, I have a hard time believing that if you read the data. Now, just a, I did have a question about that. And... Maybe it was on the previous slide. What kind of pelvic fractures were they? If you're talking lateral, um, shear, um, I didn't see that. I think LC, I'm thinking lateral, mm -hmm. LC2. You're exactly right. Okay. Yeah, so the um, LC1 and the LC2s, and then the VS or the vertical shear. Um, just, I'm not a doctor at all, but I would think just by having a lateral compression so you know one side is stoved into the other side stoving it in more with a pelvic binder probably isn't going to help um likewise you have a vertical shear there's you know not equilateral anymore squeezing them together probably also not going to fix their problem but what i I think another thing that's important to find out, okay, it didn't help. Did it harm would be the other question. And if it's no, if there's no um, increase in mortality, because especially with something like teacher, I see we have to make things kind of universal because I can't see with imagery what's happened, especially that close to the injury site. Um, I need to kind of have a universal answer of like, if you know, if they have a gunshot wound to the extremities, put tourniquet on first, and then yeah. we can assess. And I kind of, I, I do see the point of having as universal thing of, if you suspect a pelvic fracture, period, a, you know, is it harmful to put a pelvic binder on? Yeah. It's a very reasonable thought process. And um, again, I, I really love this, this idea of thinking through what are the risks and what are the benefits to your patient? Because um, that is medical decision-making right there. That's not, just not algorithmic. Um, to your point, though, as far as TC3 and pre-hospital care, I think the cat's out of the bag. So right now our protocols for, for TC3, um, ATLS on the civilian side, and all of those say, yeah, if you're going to scoop and run and throw your patient in an ambulance in a H60, uh, even if you're a cool guy and you get to throw them in a 47, sure, do it, go for it, whatever. I mean, that binder is going to be on for maybe an hour. Again, my civilian practice, when we get a pre-hospital patient in the trauma bay, who has a blunt injury pattern and they're hypotensive, we empirically throw on the pelvic binder. But the difference is within 15 minutes, I have that patient in the CT scanner and then I take off that pelvic binder. So I don't know that TC3 is really a sword that I'm going to fall on because those protocols have been approved by the committee on TC3. Um, again, I'm going to be a jerk and I'm going to say uh, when they have voted on um, some changes to the protocols, it appears to be incongruous with the levels of evidence that they are citing for their practice changing patterns. But operational medicine is hard and there is no perfect answer and there is often not great evidence. 
Right. So to your point, is there going to be a benefit in PFC? I, I think we're going to try and answer that question here in the next few slides. Is yeah. there a risk to a pelvic binder in PFC? 100% there is. Absolutely. Um, yeah, there, there is no intervention that comes without harm. Um, but good question. Yeah, so this is a problem when our colleagues are citing evidence saying that there is a benefit to pelvic binders and the evidence that they cite in, in our practice setting actually says something totally opposite. Um, and, you know, again, as an editor for the Journal of Special Operations Medicine, um, I will often dig into citations in, in articles. And very recently, I found an article that cited another article as trying to support their argument. And when I f looked into the other article, it actually said something completely different. And I'm actively trying to embargo that author for fraud so that they cannot publish. Um, so this stuff's really important to, to dig down and not just take people's um, opinions of the evidence. Because if they don't understand the evidence, um, they're just leading you astray. And then, so this is an article that our colleagues didn't cite that I found, and I think they really should have, because this is a phenomenal article. Journal of Trauma, such a great refuge. Um, this is, you know, I curl up and read this at night to go to sleep. This is, this is my happy place. Um, and you can see that it was just four years old. So again, in research, we consider publications within the last five years to be contemporary. So this is a relatively recent, uh, this is a, a retrospective analysis from our UK counterparts in their essentially JTS equivalent database, looking at combat pelvic injury patterns. Um, this is high quality evidence. This is directly applies to your practice pattern in a combat theater of operation. And what they looked at retrospectively, again, they had over 150 patients. They had over a 30% fatality. These are very severely injured people. About two thirds of them had a vascular injury and you can see um, over two thirds of them, what is that maybe even more than four fifths actually were dismounted blast. Um, this is a great group of people to look at. Holy smokes. And so just as a reminder that the point you brought up earlier, Dennis, fantastic point. These dismounted IED blasts have a completely different injury pattern than we're used to seeing in the civilian practice. And so that primary blast wave is in window B, upper right. And that's really just, they said, the sand often um, kind of peppering the skin and maybe opening up some defects in the skin. And then the secondary blast wave is in C, and that's where the blast wave actually rips off skin and muscle and also just grabs the leg uh, and opens up the pelvis and often causes that sheer amputation that you can see in D. Uh, these are terribly injured people. And here's some CT scans. These are not my own. They are not uh, patient information. They, I actually took these as a screenshot from the publication. Um, and they, they do some beautiful um, examples of just what you were talking about earlier, Dennis. So actually that upper one in B, you can see that's a lateral compression. So the right iliac wing there, how it's been kind of pushed in towards the middle, and it's actually fulcruming on the sacrum and opening up that posterior space where you can see all that black there. Um, so yeah, you, you probably don't want to be putting a a pelvic binder on that injury pattern, you're going to actually rip all those vessels by the sacrum. Um, and then the lower one, again, catastrophic injury. You can see there's a complete disruption of the sacroiliac joint where that white arrow is going down on the, the bottom. Um, and that distance there has been opened up to 22 millimeters. It should be one or two. And those vessels don't stretch that far. So there's a lot of bleeding in there. Um, it's really, really terrifying. So again, know, know the data, know your research, um, understand statistics, and, and I'm not expecting the medics to, but uh, I'm expecting that your PA and your doc are going to take the time to be experts so that you can ask them. Because again, we're, we're just consultants for the operational medics, right? You guys are the ones who are actually doing the work. We're just supposed to be the SMEs that are able to give you the five-minute answer. Um, and so when you look at dismounted fatalities on the far right, 
holy smokes, if you go down to the unstable pelvic fracture or the unstable pelvic fracture with the peritoneal injury, you're looking at a 93% mortality. That's terrifying to me. Um, that's that's a catastrophically injured patient. Or if you go all the way down to second from the bottom of pelvic vascular injury, 100% of those dismounted injuries had a fatality. And again, this came from the UK where they had ready access to their MERTs and their surgical teams. Um, this is even better availability of care than we can provide in the PFC environment. This makes me scared. And also, yeah. I think we're, we're coming up to the decision of is a pelvic binder a hat on a hat? Right? Is it, are, are we actually worried about other things? And what you're going to see here, oh, I hope I highlighted it. Let's see. Oh, yes, I did it. So their data showed that these people who had pelvic fractures who died, died from other injuries because if you had a pelvic fracture, right, the, the anterior and posterior pelvic um, ligaments are some of the strongest ligaments in the body. If you rupture those, that's just a canary in the coal mine that this dude is messed up super bad and they're probably going to die. And it's probably not from the pelvic injury. It's probably from all the other stuff that they also got injured with. So that upper uh, paragraph says that in civilian populations, if you've got a pelvic injury and you um, die, it's probably from other injuries. And the bottom paragraph says that in this study, in the combat environment, they found that if you had a pelvic injury and you died, it was probably from other injuries, not the pelvis. And that if you only had the pelvic injury, you had a pretty low chance of mortality. So that's the evidence on pelvic binders and POI golden hour care. How does that apply to PFC? What are you thinking so far, Dennis? I mean, I found so far um, what you do in haste in T tri C, you end up paying for in PFC. Um, but at the same time, you don't have to ever worry about PFC if he doesn't live in T tri C. So it's, it's, uh, you know, six of one, half dozen the other almost um, if you don't do a good job. And, but it, I think it, it makes 100% sense to, received a uh, strong enough energy uh, to disrupt like an incredibly strong bone. Um, they're going to have other injuries and, you know, something like a pelvic fracture, let's just say that he isn't succumbing to those other injuries yet, but just the pain from that pelvic injury is going to be a hundred percent distracting to that you want to treat that and stabilize that and then people tend to move on to other things yeah, i don't know if, if that makes point. any sense yeah well said yeah so that's kind of the, the the rundown and then to finally here we are i don't know 50 minutes into this presentation trying to finally get to the question that you asked at the beginning um and so where does all this fit into prolonged field care? And this is a, a breakdown from some uh, partner force training that we were doing a while back. And um, I love this flow chart. I'm going to use it forevermore. And Asterix, I did not make it up. It came from a very, very, very smart operational medic. Um, but, you know, so we, we know this. Here's the visual flow. You do that care under fire with your in your teams, then you can collapse down to the CCP, maybe do some TFC. Um, for this event, it was in a, a UW contested environment, so our movement didn't really have a lot of CASVAC uh, care provided. Uh, and then we collapsed back to the safe house where we engaged with our prolonged field care. And your patients in the safe house, I think, really only have three outcomes. They're either going to be expectant, they're going to be a return to duty, and they're going to walk out and go back to the fight, or they're at some point going to require a um, movement to a higher level of care when you are able to facilitate that. And uh, as we talked about about a, a year ago, I think, on this show, um, in trying to organize the thought process for PFC into a similar 
phases of care like TC3, um, somebody else, not me, very, very smart medic, came up with this idea of peace knot. And I love this. It has really helped me and also in teaching folks who aren't as familiar with PFC about how to organize your care because a lot of folks vapor lock when we, we ask them. And so this stabilization, normalization, observation, and transportation kind of is similar to the damage control surgery uh, four steps that we do. And it, it, it's a good way to consider um, what phase of care your patient is. And so if we start to think about a patient in PFC with a pelvic fracture, you know, that initial surgical stabilization by doctrine is going to be these four things, uh, a sheet or a pelvic binder, peritoneal packing, pelvic external fixation, um, or coil embolization with your interventional radiologist. Which of those have you got as a operational uh, medic? The pelvic binder. <laughs> yep, that's right. So there we are. Um, the practicality of our real-world environment has told us that during the stabilization fair phase of PFC, we can put on a binder or a sheet. You know, again, our uh, orthopedic surgeons much prefer a sheet. Um, and I uh, saw this in a previous journal, of Special Operations Medicine article. I blatantly stole it, um, and. Uh, I will go full fanboy. The first author for that article was uh, my trauma spirit animal, Stacy Shackelford. Um, so this is fantastic, right? I always put a pelvic binder on there. But then what do you do with it? Well, uh, again, from a trauma surgery perspective, uh, in the normalization phase of care, we're going to normalize physiology, and then we're going to attempt to normalize anatomy. So normalizing physiology for you in the PFC environment is probably going to be a whole lot of blood. Are you going to have a whole lot of blood? Probably not. Yeah. What's right, a lot, average I case. guess? More than one? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that a great, great idea? Um, so these patients generally take a massive transfusion protocol. Um, do you guys teach that at the schoolhouse? Um, as far as, I mean, we talk about it and that it's 10 yeah. or more units. Um, yeah. That, that's like the gold standard which yeah, that's a gold standard for us. I'm sure it's like bare minimum for a hospital, um, but it's more of recognizing like, okay, we've, you have one unit, maybe two units available. You need to rapidly get to your walking blood bank. So you, you need to recognize this person is going to take more than what you have, engage that walking blood bank and get that rolling early because that also takes time. Yeah, what a good point. You, and you're absolutely right. So, you know, the, the doctrinal definition of a massive transfusion protocol is essentially requiring an entire whole body transfusion um, within the first 24 hours. So typically a 70 kilo patient has about five liters of circulating blood, which with um, units being somewhere around 500 cc's is about 10, 10 units of blood. Um, and so, yeah, our forward surgical teams typically... Yeah, I'm not sure if I can divulge that, but, you know, carry more than that, obviously. Um, in the hospital, we certainly carry more than that. Uh, and then uh, massive transfusion protocol is a surrogate marker, so it tells us somebody is really, really sick. Um, and what's the upper limit in the hospital? So we have attempted to define what futile transfusions are. Historically, in civilian settings, we've been using component care. So unfortunately, that is when you spin out the red blood cells, the plasma, and the platelets, and you give them separately. It's got a bunch of other junk in there. Um, it's not a great way to resuscitate a patient, but administratively, it's what we've got in the civilian setting. Somewhere around 50 units is essentially considered futile care, and that's based on some really good data showing that if somebody needs that many, they're probably so far down the coagulopathy cascade that they're not coming back. And, and again, um, the folks like myself have had to be at the bedside and tell family members that we are no longer going to transfuse blood because um, we're running all the blood out of the hospital and we don't expect a, a good outcome regardless of continuing to get blood in. Um, that's not a fun experience 
um, but it is an experience that's invaluable for teaching. And, and so um, I, I don't take um, discussion of expectant care lightly. It's, it's a really hard topic, and I don't mean to be glib about it because um, it's a terrible place to have to be. But the reality is there are some patients for which that is the appropriate decision. Um, what's really interesting is there's some, some new data coming around that with whole blood, our futile care limit may be as low as 30 units instead of 50 from component care um, because whole blood is so much better at uh, resuscitating your patients that if you get to 30 and it's still not working, it may not work at any higher limit, which is really fascinating. But yeah, to your point, PFC, you got to normalize physiology. You're going to have a really hard time doing that with your blood on hand if you don't have the ability to do a walking blood bank or you have higher acuity patients that may have a higher probability of a good outcome, i.e. stay alive. These patients may not get it. And then how are you going to normalize anatomy in these patients? Well, after you do imaging, according to um, ortho bullets, you're going to figure out which of the buckets these uh, patients' pelvic fractures fall into, whether it's non-operative, open reduction, internal fixation, or, or percutaneous pinning. Imaging, you say? Hmm, what imaging are we going to need? Well, again, according to ortho bullets for an x-ray, these are the different images that you want. Cool. Um, I have, fair enough, I've tried to do these actually in a far forward setting with our little... Um, mobile x-ray and it is not easy i mean it's the reason those x-rays were sent far forward is solely to support the atls algorithm of a chest x-ray and a pelvis x-ray uh, it turns out we use those x-rays for everything else and the quality of imaging that's shot is really bad right and i'm the one who's shooting it so i'll, I'll tell you that and then also who is reading those poor poorly shot x-rays this guy and and you know who's not a radiologist me um so so here we are without the appropriate imaging to make the appropriate clinical decisions uh guess what other imaging modality ortho bullets wants us to get in these trauma patients to make surgical decisions um i would guess ct but that's impossible yep. right yeah, so, so they want us to run the patient through the answer box or the, the donut of death because our trauma patients really like to die in the, the CT scanner. Um, and so ortho bullets, this is a screenshot, says this is a routine part of pelvic ring injury evaluation because um, you're going to characterize the posterior ring, assess for comminution and fragment rotation. And um, again, if you've got to put a screw through the sacroiliac posteriorly, you're going to be able to assess where those fracture lines are relative to the sacral foramina, which is where all the neurovascular bundles are that you really want to miss because sticking a giant th screw through there, it's a bad day. So in the PFC environment, um, what do you guys normally have for imaging? Ultrasound, which is just like CT. <laughs> I sense some sarcasm. Um, have you heard of any of the guys using the EOD x-rays for this or, or for, um, for humans? <laughs> uh, I've heard definitely for just fractures. I haven't heard anything specific to pelvic injuries. Um, and I've also, uh, when I've reached out to try and talk about this use, um, usually I get hung up on really quick. Yeah, man. So this is a bummer. Um, again, I'm going to, cards on the table, Journal of Special Operations Medicine published an article um, about how cool you could look if you used EOD for humans. Um, and that article had to get retracted. Um, and I think perhaps the doctor who wrote that may no longer be a doctor. Um, yeah, yeah, it was a really bad day. So look, man, for our medics that are out there alone and afraid, do what you need to do to take care of the patient, right? I, I am not going to be the wanker who's going to criticize you for trying to do the right thing in a very difficult environment. Yeah. That's cool. But if this is just kind of a, wow, look at me, I'm cool, I can do this thing, or I don't need to bring imaging because I can just use the EOD device, that's probably the wrong decision making. Um, and again, the, the quality of the image is probably below what is adequate for clinical decision making. And then the bigger one is, who's going to be reading your x-rays? If it's an obvious fracture of the pelvis, 
cool. What are you going to do about it from a surgical perspective? I don't know. Nothing. The patient's probably, yeah. as we've seen from earlier research, if they've got a potentially fatal pelvic fracture, all of their other injuries are going to tell you that they need to be evacuated anyway. So this alone is not going to change your decision-making for evacuation, and it's you're still not going to be able to do surgery. Um, we like to, to joke that, you know, irradiating a patient may fix them because that's kind of like a part of the treatment algorithm, but it's not. Um, so let's see. We got ultrasound to your point. Awesome. Love ultrasound. Ultrasound's super cool. Um, most of the deltas, J's, NSW guys that I talk to really like using ultrasound. They are so task saturated from operational requirements that they don't have the white space to do the sets and reps to maintain competency. And that is absolutely not a them problem. That's a leadership problem uh, for which we should be uh, voicing a higher concern. And so what are you going to see with ultrasound? Well, ortho bullets, again, the kind of hallmark says that from an imaging perspective, here's what you want to see is a greater than five millimeter displacement in the posterior sacroiliac complex. Not going to see that with ultrasound. Uh, presence of a posterior sacrofractural gap. Maybe if you're really, really, really good and you're lucky and the stars aligned and it's Tuesday and it's a full moon, maybe you'll see that. Um, or some avulsion fractures. Uh, and again, that's that's just not going to change my clinical decision-making in a multi-system trauma patient. Um, I will say anecdotally, which is not data, we covered that, uh, there are some smart folks out there who just say that they will run their thumb across the um, anterior pelvis, and if their thumb is able to divot into the um, pubis symphysis there, then they know that there's a widening of the, the diastasis and that to them is concerning for an open book fracture. I think that's pretty cool. I could certainly yeah. see using ultrasound for that. I mean, I would imagine the screaming that would take place doing that would also clue you in that there's something <laughs> wrong. Uh, see, you're the voice of reason, my friend. Um, yeah. but you're right. Um, <laughs> So um, the, the operational environment has been really good at picking up the OODA loop and applying it to medicine. And so I will posit the question of, cool, you can observe that your patient may have signs and symptoms indicative of a pelvic fracture. Um, you may be able to figure out that it's an open book pelvic fracture, which may have some vascular injuries. Um, you're going to orient that this is a polytrauma patient. You're in a uh, A2AD PFC environment, so your decision is still to sit on the patient for 96 hours. Cool. How is any of this, or even putting the pelvic binder on, changing your actions? Um, what do you think? I mean, right, right now, I mean, it's not really changing anything. The only thing I'm hoping to happen is I've at least stabilized it, so all my transportations and assessments and rolling and moving doesn't make it worse. Yeah, that's fair. And yeah, and on, on the same chat, actually, you know, um, Rick put out a, a really great point that he had recently done an MPT. He'd gotten a bunch of sets and reps. He'd seen a number of pelvic fractures. Um, and to your point, you know, what he said is none of them had vascular injuries, but a significant portion of them had pretty good pain control from the splinting that was applied by that appropriately placed pelvic fracture. So that's a good point. Uh, but again, in PFC, once we move on from normalization and we're just sitting on this patient, here we are observing for however long it's going to take for that patient until they can get them to the next role of care. Um, are we going to keep the pelvic binder on? Well, the general recommendation is they probably shouldn't be on greater than 24 hours because um, you're going to, with almost 100% certainty, going to be causing soft tissue injuries. Um, if you end up causing a stage three sacral decubiti with um, like necrotizing fasciitis for a patient who never even had a vascular injury to begin with, you have caused a significant harm. Um, and, you know, in 72 hours, this patient's probably going to poop would be my guess. That's part of that nursing bundle that we do. Um, and if so. you don't clean right. And, and so what are we going to do? Take the pelvic binder off at 96 hours, scoop all the poop out from underneath it, clean them up and then put it back on. That's also probably not 
awesome. Um, it may beat the alternative of leaving a bunch of wet um, poop to macerate the skin and, again, cause soft tissue breakdown. But, I mean, uh, these pelvic binders were never designed to be on for more than 24 hours. You were supposed to get imaging and definitive surgical care or take them off. Oh, quick question about, especially about yeah. pelvic binder design. So a lot of them, I think just from uh, the idea of you know, smaller, faster, sexier, um, they get to be pretty narrow um, or maybe three, four inches wide. Um, and they are like super sexy. Um, however, yeah. all that pressure is on a, you have a smaller surface area. I think that's a lot more likely to cause problems later on. Mm -hmm. Another technique is just like blankets or sheets, you know, and that can cover the entire pelvis, the, the superior portion of the, the thigh, um, lower portion of the abdomen. And by I'm thinking by just um, surface area covered, you would make uh, the, the, the risk of uh, pressure sores less. I mean, obviously, depending on the patient's hemodynamic status and their perfusion of that skin, it's not going to alleviate your problems when it comes to, you know, urination and defecation. Um, but what we just went over, went through so far, pelvic binder shouldn't be on for greater than 24 hours. Mm -hmm. If the patient has been stable, so let's say 12 hours, I've done my serial ultrasounds like my fast exams, I'm not seeing any blood and the patient is not acting as though they um, they have a vascular injury. Um, there's no like scrotal hematomas. There's no bruising. Like so far, everything is pointing that there is no vascular injury. Could I use yeah. that as a, since I don't have CT, um, my ultrasound scanning skills of the pelvic um, ring is a joke at best and um you know the batteries are out of my eod laser gun there um could i use just those tools saying i don't think he has a a vascular injury to this to loosen the binder yeah it's a good question there's like seven good questions in there um, <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> winning um so again, I am not a board certified orthopedic uh, trauma surgeon, um, but I do play one on TV, right? So I, I did that for a while. And, and in the PA fellowship that the army puts on, we actually do two months of orthopedic trauma specifically so that we can do that initial orthopedic uh, stabilization in a far forward environment. So uh, the views are my own and I yes. am probably wrong. And people are going to be really angry at me. And I'm super excited that they have an emotional response because it means they care about their patient. Um, but uh, so in, I, I would say, through the phases of care, one of the things that our orthopedic surgeons at almost every hospital I've been to um, wants to do almost immediately is once they have identified a open book pelvic fracture that is going to benefit from a pelvic binder, they try to take off those pre-hospital ones um, because they are too narrow. Um, and I'll, I'll say as well that the T-Pod is um, generally not as favorably received, and that's because based on its um, mechanical advantage, people way over-tighten it. You, you're actually not supposed to wrench down on a pelvic binder. You're just trying to close back to normal anatomy, which is why, personally, I prefer the SAM because it's got that tactile feedback to let you know when you're at exactly the right tension, um, and I, I think that's better for the patients. Um, as we know, and I'm sure as you teach at the schoolhouse, these are all placed far too high. They're actually supposed to be over the greater trochanter. Um, and so our trauma surgeons, our orthopedic trauma surgeons, when they see a no kidding open book fracture, will grab a sheet and some giant long um, instruments and they will use a, a folded down sheet folded lengthwise to create that broad um, app 
replication across the greater trochanters to try and reapproximate normal anatomy. Um, so that's that's going to be a better, longer-term splint application. Um, in terms of if we didn't have imaging to diagnose this, where would I be comfortable? So the other challenge, of course, as we know well, is the pelvis is actually in the retroperitoneal space. And so if there is a life-threatening amount of bleeding, we're not going to see it on the fast because that's all intraperitoneal. Um, and the fast does not show you the retroperitoneal space. Um, which is, if you may remember, um, when we're looking for a retroperitoneal bleeds, there's zones one, two, and three. So this would probably be like a, a zone three retroperitoneal hemorrhage from the pelvis, um, which doctrinally we almost never surgically explore because, again, that is an area that is uh, almost exclusively, not always, venous in nature, which means it's low pressure and will likely tamponade and occlude on its own and not require surgical intervention. So to your point, yeah, man, I mean, if I had a dismounted IED blast, um, single system trauma patient that I was only worried about a pelvic fracture and I was going to um, sit on them for 72 or 96 hours till I could find an evacuation platform, um, I would be tempted to use my medical decision making and try and downgrade the, the splint um, when it seemed clinically appropriate. I would say the there's this paradox, right, where the, the people who have pelvic injuries who are so bad off that they are at risk of demise probably have a bunch of other injuries that are higher priority, and they are probably not going to survive movement in a PFC environment regardless of the care that we're able to provide. I 100% understand. Um, yeah. But my question is, can I use just that clinical decision-making and let's say I'm wrong, right? And I release the tension. I do another, I do some more serial exams. You know, that's the only fast exam. That's the only one I know to do to look into the abdomen. Yeah. I don't know yeah. if there's another way to look retroperitoneal with ultrasound. Um, so I'm doing the best I can. I would imagine if he had a bleed from the initial injury after 12 hours, that thing has been clotted off and stabilized. Like if it was going to, it would have done it in that period of time. I'm, I've given them my TXA. Um, I also like calcium as well because I think it direct it has more of effect on the clotting cascade um, as far as being able to produce a clot. Um, so I've I've done the things. Now I'd like to you know wheel reel back some of my treatments but I lack the imaging to do it mm -hmm. properly, essentially. Just using, would you use, just use your clinical uh, decision-making to take that chance? Yeah, and, and that's really where I think the, the idea for this show came from is in, in our chat group, the, the question started out with, are pelvic binders appropriate? And what that question quickly morphed to is, you probably should put on a pelvic binder in TC3, but then you put it on and you own that pelvic binder. And how are you going to manage that in the PFC environment? Because again, TC3 cats out of the bag. Those protocols are there. Um, yeah, I personally, if I was managing this patient, would use clinical decision making to take off a pelvic binder if even in light of having not been able to definitively rule out a pelvic fracture with imaging. Um, your mileage may vary. Uh, obviously, yeah. it's up to, to you in the alone and afraid, possibly naked environment. Yeah. Um, and hopefully, you have thought about this ahead of time. And most importantly, I think these hard, hard decisions even if you make the right decision, can really lead to the second victim syndrome down the road, especially if you're treating a teammate. Um, and so these are, are decisions that I hope none of our operational medics have to make um, by themselves. And I, I do hope that you have a really good pace plan for telemed in place. Um, we do, as we were talking about earlier before the, the recording, have the doctrinal advisor line, um, which is often well staffed by a lot of our excellent colleagues um, you should probably also have in place a plan to um, be able to contact your 
uh, battalion surgeon or your PA um, by multiple modalities. And I know that there's a lot of medics out there um, that say they've they've got their favorite folks on speed dial as well. And you know, I've I've taken calls at two in the morning from folks who say, "Hey, man, I got a really tough decision here. Can you help me out with that?" And that's that's really important. Um, even it, me in the ICU when I'm taking care of a traumatically injured patient, um, and there's hard decisions, we load the boat. You know, trauma is a team sport, um, and and certainly uh, engaging other people to help with hard decisions is appropriate. But if I was out there by myself, 72, 96 hours, I would put on my thinking hat, um, which is really what critical care is about, is thinking um, and determine if it was appropriate to discontinue a pelvic binder. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. You really held my feet to the fire on that one. I like it. I know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then, and escape you know, that rap- easy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is why you're in charge, man. You're not you're not letting any of this BS slide. Um, and and so again, kind of in thinking about PFC from a formulaic perspective through our snot algorithm. Once we get to transportation, again, these guys are leaving through three routes. They're going to uh, get movement out to definitive roles of care at some point when the A2 AD environment allows for it, or if you're in Ukraine, once the Russians finally you know run out of mortars. Um, you're going to ambulate out and potentially be a return to service to continue the fight, um, which our soft folks are phenomenal about, you know, in diatribe here. Um, Doc Rush's stuff about the mass cal is, is absolutely phenomenal. And I, I love his approach because um, he said this whole um, routine casualties on a mass cal is absolute BS. If, if there's anybody on your fob, this routine, they're up on the wall, they're continuing the fight, um, which is true and is awesome. So these guys are going to return to duty if they can. Or unfortunately, there's going to be a not insignificant portion of our folks in PFC, LISCO, Proxy, whatever venue you're in that are going to be expectant. And that's that's the harsh reality. And I, I sure hope that these folks um, listening that are out there actually doing the hard work are not having to deal with this by themselves because it's really hard. So from ortho bullets. What they say is um, this is a significant injury pattern, and I think that they don't do a good job of saying, because it's a surrogate marker, that when you see these injuries, you also see a bunch of other injuries, which is why in the civilian practice, any pelvic fracture has a 1% to 15% mortality rate for closed fractures and 50% mortality rate for open fractures in the civilian environment. That's huge. Um, they accurately note that hemorrhage is the leading cause of overall death. And I think what they're trying to imply and what a lot of people hear is that it's the pelvic hemorrhage that's the cause of overall death. But in looking at the data, I think that's, a, I think that's misleading. And while hemorrhage may be the leading cause of death in pelvic fractures, I think that hemorrhage may be in places other than the pelvis. Um, and, and they actually highlight that in the next bullet point, which is that um, for a lot of these injuries, actually it's the closed head injury in patients with a pelvic fracture that is the cause of death. Um, and you can see down there, you should your spidey sense should be tingling in people with low blood pressures, the um, anterior-posterior compression grade 3 uh, fracture, or a need for more than 3 units of uh, blood transfused. So uh, this is again from John Hins. I, I love it. Uh, this is one of his take-homes from, oh, it's down in the corner there. Maybe it was the CODA conference. I'm not sure. It was uh, something It was something before that. Okay, um, gotcha. Yeah. Man, guys would do well to go watch some of his yeah. stuff. He's, he was a phenomenal speaker. Uh, so good. And, you know, this is his takeaway is prepare, know the evidence. Make your intentions honorable, which I think we've, we've covered a few points here. Um, if you think you are doing the right thing, even if you're not, I am personally going to back you up if you you are honorable in your decision making. Um, have the courage to do it. You know, whatever scenario the case may be, if you think that um, doing something is the right thing, then go for it. Uh, seek out the skeptics; they will be your allies. And I love this one: never allow a wanker to bring you down. Um, so this is what we talked about. Right. Uh, understand your levels of evidence. Um, understand your anatomy and injury. Uh, pelvic binders are a part of the POI and Golden Hour Care, so 
that's that fine um but hopefully it's been clear through this discussion that um, blindly ascribing pelvic binders to the PFC environment may be a bit of an overreach. And again, I'm, I'm looking forward to having somebody else come on after this um, to really shoot down all of my thoughts and, and give us a different perspective. So hopefully that's to follow. I'm sure right now some... somebody's spitting their coffee out. <laughs> Great. That means they care and they are emotionally invested in doing the right thing for their patients. And I am really glad to hear that. Um, you know, the, uh, the definition of a philosopher is someone who loves knowledge. So I will consider myself a weekend philosopher. I love knowledge. Here's um, some of the different things that I used to put this talk together. Um, I will highly, highly recommend the Behind the Knife podcast. Um, for those who are not aware, it's actually a couple of military trauma surgeons. Um, they do a phenomenal job there. They are, you know, subject matter experts, and their user interface is uh, world class. I was actually chatting with one of their friends. So they have to spend mid six digits every year on their podcast website. And because they're in the military, they can't take any of that money. So they, um, you know, feed all of that into the podcast itself. And, it, and there is a love of passing on knowledge about critically ill patients that is in that podcast that, that I can't recommend enough. Um, and then, of course, all the other stuff. And, um, you know, again, my perspective is us as uh, medical enablers, docs, PAs, we are really the consultants that should help you do a great job of you out in the field taking care of your patients. Um, I hope that your PA or a doc is um, helping make themselves a better clinician by working in a high volume trauma center, and they should be bringing you along for MPT if you've got the white space. People often ask what journals I read, um, so that's what I try to thumb through every night, and I hope that your medical consultants are also doing the same. Uh, what else can you think of, Dennis? Um, as far as resources? Um, um, it's your show. You tell me. I wouldn't trust anything that comes out of my mouth, but... Um, <laughs> you know, I think... Maybe less than the resources, if there was something I could advise somebody on um, when they're reading any kind of research. One, like, what did they find? What is, how did they find it? Like, what is the context of what they're actually looking at? Um, and I think, you know, like, one of the articles you brought up, like, there was no benefit. Okay. Was there harm? Um, I think just in general, Human interaction. I think we have to resist the uh, the temptation of I'm right, and uh, I'm going to find all the the data to support I'm right. Um, maybe take a moment. Um, you know, don't you don't have to look into a mirror or anything like that. Just be by yourself in the quiet and just think for a moment. Like, um, is there any validity to what they're saying? in the context of what I'm looking at, you know, and what I see, if they say no harm, if they say no benefit, my immediate question is, well, is there any harm? Because I can't see the types of fractures. So if I put a pelvic binder on a lateral compression fracture or a shear fracture, am I going, am I causing harm? That would be something I'd really like to know. And I, to be honest, I, I haven't found that yet. Um, but I hope somebody listening will be like, okay, um, and send it. Yeah. Yeah. Fair point. Mm. Um, well said. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I, I love how I get the compliments that, uh, <laughs> it boosts my, uh, my ego a little bit. Yeah. Fair. Well, uh, if I can put one last plug out, right? So um, you guys in the operational environment have, I think, one of the hardest jobs in the world, which is you've got to be really good at doing all your team jobs. You've got to be good at your administrative responsibilities. And you're expected to be good, not just at any medicine, but at doing high, high quality, 
high acuity medicine in a limited resource environment. That is a very, very challenging job to have. Um, and so I'm just going to throw the plug out there, right, which is that was one of the main reasons that the Special Operations Medical Association was created was to try and level the bubble and help you. Um, so Special Operations Medical Association Training and Scientific Assembly is coming up this May 13 through 17 in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, I am helping run that this year along with Chris Hewitt, and we would very, very much like to have you come join us um, because he and I are, as well as Andy O from last year, we're all committed to helping make your job better and easier out there. And if there's ways that we can do that, man, let me know, right? I, I'm here to help you take care of your patients and, and you guys are phenomenal at what you do. You're committed. Um, you're wonderful human beings and, and we want to help you take care of your teammates. So if we can do that better, uh, I'm, I'm willing to take criticism, just uh, help provide some, some answers as well as some paths forwards. But hopefully we'll see you all at the conference. Perfect place to stop. Thank you, Alex. I really appreciate it. For today's podcast, be sure to go to our website, www.prolongfieldcare.org. Find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. Subscribe and stay on the bleeding edge of combat medicine. This is Dennis for the PFC Podcast. Out.